we're ready to go. We're still not hearing Jody. She's talking, but I can't hear her. Jody, we can't hear you. Can you? Jody's going to have to come up to where I am and use my microphone, so give her a moment. All right, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. All right, looks like we're gonna get started. So I'm going to go ahead and um, do my part here. I will say all rise just because that's the respectful thing to do, but <laughs> I don't want everyone necessarily to stand up. So um, the Honorable Charles R. Wilson, United States Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit presiding. The Honorable Lisa Godby Wood, United States District Court for the Southern District of Georgia presiding. The Honorable Marcia Morales Howard, United States District Court for the Middle District of Florida presiding. The Honorable Brian Jordan Davis, United States District Court for the Middle District of Florida presiding. The Honorable Stan Baker, United States District Court for the Southern District of Georgia presiding. Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. This honorable court is now in session. All persons having business before this court, draw near, give attention, and you shall be heard. God save the United States and this honorable court. And we are here today on the case of United States of America versus Lucy Diamond, docket number 19, CR3456, and you may be seated. Good morning. I know that I speak for all of the judges this morning to say that we're delighted to be here for the 40th annual Florida Georgia Halsey Gambrell Moot Court Competition. Thank you for inviting us. And we'd like to uh, commend these two law firms for continuing this annual tradition for 40 consecutive years because opportunities like this are, are an important part of a law student's legal education and orientation to the practice of law. So we're all anxious to hear the arguments and I'm sure the students who are presenting them have worked hard to be here and are well prepared to present their arguments. Uh, we've read the briefs and the issues are actually pretty interesting and they're quite current. We see these sorts of issues from time to time in our courts. Um, my colleagues, my four colleagues have participated before, but this is my first opportunity to serve as a, as a judge of this competition. So thank you for the invitation and welcome to the United States Court of Appeals for the 14th Circuit. Thank you, Judge Wilson. I'm Steve Busey of the law firm of Smith, Halsey & Busey, the Florida-based law firm of Smith, Halsey & Busey. We're pleased to have the opportunity again for the 40th year to co-sponsor this competition with the Georgia-based law firm of Smith, Gambrell, and Russell. It's unfortunate due to the circumstances of this year that we have to do this virtually, uh, but among the silver linings is we've all collectively advanced our technological skills this year, and we're continuing to do that. Uh, I'm going to, uh, I'm hopeful that next year we'll be able to do this back together again in the collegiality of the federal courthouse in Jacksonville, Florida. But this is it's great that we have us all together this morning and we look forward to hearing the arguments. Before we get started, I'm going to ask Dana Bradford from Smith Cambrell to address the, the court and the students briefly. And after Dana, then Lanny Russell, my partner is going to give a very brief history. I hope very brief history of the competition and then we'll get to the arguments. Dana. Thank you, Steve. Uh, good morning, and may it please the court. Good morning to all. 
I hope you can hear me because uh, and see me because I can see you only if I turn my head. So I don't want to be rude and I'm going to look at this uh, high tech camera we're talking into. It's rather refreshing for the first time in a few months to actually be standing at a lectern and, <laughs> and talking to the court, even though I can't see you. Uh, this, uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about Smith, Gambrell, and Russell. Uh, we are the Georgia based co sponsor of this competition. Our firm is, uh, goes back to 1893 originally and is one of the oldest, if not the oldest, in Atlantic and continuing practice. Uh, it is now an international firm. We have offices throughout the United States and a couple overseas. We were asked, I was asked several years ago by Lanny Russell uh, to co-sponsor this so we would have a joint Florida Georgia base to the competition to match the teams that were going to do battle in the moot court competition each year and to set this up and become involved and we've enjoyed the several years we've been involved in it now. I forget how many but it's been quite a few. Uh, the uh, name on the trophy uh, is the Halsey Gambrell competition. I always like to say a few words about Mr. Gambrell, who is the partner in Atlanta who practiced in the last century, principally in the first part of the first half of it, and his accomplishments because his name was selected by us to go on the trophy along with uh, my good friend, the late Mark Halsey. Uh, Smythe Gambrell practiced in Atlanta for many years and was a distinguished trial lawyer, uh, not just the quality of his work, but the professionalism and the civility that he brought to the trial practice. Uh, he was known for his community service and bar service as well. Uh, he was continuously throughout his career an adjunct professor at Emory Law School. He was also one of the founders, of, uh, the, co the principal founder of the ja Atlanta Legal Aid Society. He eventually became president of the American Bar Association. And through his committee work and his continuing emphasis and desire to put professionalism into the practice as something that we think about constantly uh, he is now remembered for those efforts by the fact that the ABA has an annual professionalism award. It's called the E. Smythe Gambrell Professionalism Award on his behalf. And it's given each year based upon application and merit uh, to uh, the firm or an individual who demonstrates professionalism and represents the best about the legal practice. The uh, State Bar of Georgia eventually named their professionalism center after Mr. Gambrell, which reflects also that his uh, nationwide reputation remained focused in Georgia and is preserved there uh, for all time. In any event, I know that Lanny wants to tell you about the competition and its history, and I'm going to turn it over to him now, and thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Dana, and good morning, judicial panel, and students, and deans. Thank you for being with us today. I'm Lenny Russell, as Steve said, a member of the Smith, Halsey, and Busey Law Firm. I do want to give you just a brief background on this competition. This competition got started in 1979, when then Dean Tom Reed at the University of Florida College of Law called Mark Halsey and suggested to Mark that it would be a good idea to have a moot court competition between the colleges of law of Florida and Georgia the day before the annual football game. Mark agreed with the Dean and chose to undertake the organization of that event. Mark was an alumni of the University of Florida College of Law and a good choice because of his activities on behalf of the University of Florida College of Law. 
Mark called a good friend of his, Charlie Kimbrell, who practiced in Miami, Florida. And Charlie Kimbrell was a graduate of the University of Georgia School of Law and also an active alumni. Charlie agreed to co-sponsor the event with Mythology and Busey. And it went on for a number of years as the Halsey Kimbrell moot court competition. And Dana explained how it's now changed to the Halsey Gambrell moot court competition. Um, and I will say is about Mark. Mark was very much like Smythe Gambrell in that he was an exceptional warrior, a great leader in the organized bar, and a very active member and benefactor of his community. I'll tell you one small piece of folklore about this event. In the first 20 years of this event, it actually, the new court competition, predicted the outcome of the football game. It actually predicted it conversely. And that is that whoever won, whichever school, won the moot court competition, lost the football game. And it got to be such a uh, legend that we actually had the sports media, the national sports media, come to the event. They could have cared less about the competition. They wanted to tell the story about the ability of the moot court competition to predict the outcome of the game. Um, that correlation between the um, moot court event and the game has now stopped and it no longer uh, has that phenomenon associated with it. One other brief observation about the event. Mark Halsey came to my office in about 1984, I believe, and asked that I help him put this event on. And when Mark asked that, I really didn't have a concept of how much of an impact my ability to participate in this event would have on me. From this event, I got to watch some of the outstanding jurists in the nation, I'm sure. And from that interaction, I got to see how much those judges, and there's been many of them um, who participated in this event, how much the judges cared about being good judges, how much they cared about our legal profession, and how much they cared about the effective education of those who would soon become lawyers through things like this moot court event. I also had the opportunity to now to watch many dozens of outstanding law students make excellent arguments during this proceeding. I thank you all for participating and look forward to seeing you next year here in Jacksonville, where we can enjoy some of the camaraderie that we have become used to. Thank you. And Dean Rutledge, if you would now go ahead and introduce the uh, Georgia competitors. Certainly. Um, uh, Chief Judge Wilson, and may it please the court, uh, my name is Bo Rutledge. Uh, I'm the Dean of the University of Georgia Law School. Uh, I send you all greetings from Athens and hope that you and your families and your courthouse colleagues remain well during this pandemic and this difficult time. Um, it's an honor to be here, if only virtually, to see uh, history made in at least two respects. Uh, the first respect being that, to my knowledge, this is the first time that this long-standing competition has ever taken place virtually. And the second respect, and I sort of hesitate to say this, uh, this is certainly the first instance in my memory in which it would be perfectly acceptable for both Georgia and Florida's football teams to win tomorrow, which will just make <laughs> and that much more exciting next Saturday. Uh, but recognizing that this is a competition, uh, I'm pleased to introduce our two competitors to each of you. Uh, visible on the Zoom screen right now is Mr. Jason Segalos. Jason is an Atlanta native who has a long history in college debate, where he was both a debater and the debate coach of the Emory debate team. Uh, he is a uh, winner of our second year moot court competition, a finalist in our first year moot court competition. He's editor in chief of the Law Review uh, and following graduation, uh, Judge Wilson, you may run into him as he'll be clerking for Judge Lanier Anderson on the 11th Circuit. Uh, following Mr. Segalos, uh, you will later see as our second advocate, Mr. Andre Washington. Mr. Washington is originally from Hinesville, Georgia, 
And prior to entering law school, he served as a political consultant where his uh, work included serving as the chief of staff on the campaign for Jason Carter when he ran for governor of Georgia. Mr. Washington is also a member of the Law Review, the Moot Court team, the Mock Trial team, and after graduation will be working for the law firm Anderson, Tate & Carr. I wish both our competitors, the competitors from Florida, a great competition. It's always good to see my friend, Dean Rosenberry, who's doing an amazing job running a great law school in Florida. And thank you again for being here and giving your time. It's all yours, Laura. Thank you so much, Bo. May it please the court. My name is Laura Rosenberry, and I'm the Dean of University of Florida Levin College of Law. I too am honored to be present today for this historic event. And I thank all the judges for taking time out of your busy dockets to support our students today. Um, I also thank my friend, Dean Rutledge for continuing to support the relationship between uh, our two great law schools. We have uh, two wonderful students appearing before you today. The first is Dylan Mayer. Uh, Mr. Mayer is a third year student here at UF Law. He's originally from Greenville, South Carolina. He completed his undergraduate studies at the Citadel, Citadel the Military College of South Carolina. Um, at the Citadel, he earned his Bachelor's of Arts in English, and he was a member of the track and cross country teams. Um, following his first year of law school, Dylan served as a judicial intern to the Honorable Harvey E. Schlesinger of the United States District Court of the Middle District of Florida. And this past summer, he worked as a law clerk at Dean Ringer's Morgan and Lawton in Orlando, Florida. Uh, Mr. Meyer is actually arguing today from Colorado um, because he is currently spending a semester in practice um, for the United States Air Force JAG Corps at the F.E. Warren Air Force Base in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Welcome to Dylan. Our second competitor is Brittany Hermanson. Ms. Hermanson is a second year student at UF Law. Um, she's originally from Portland, Oregon. She graduated in 2017 from Baylor University with a bachelor's degree in political science. Um, Ms. Hermanson hopes to practice commercial litigation and uh, to pursue a master's of law in, ta in taxation, uh, hopefully from our graduate tax program here at UF Law. Um, Ms. Hermanson is currently a member of the James Atkins Inn of Court and the Young Lawyers Division of the Florida Bar, and she has spent the past year volunteering for an income tax assistance program designed to support the underserved. We are very happy that Ms. Hermanson is joining us today uh, from a classroom here in Gainesville, Florida. Thank you very much. Well, given those um, introductions, it appears that we are now ready to proceed to hear arguments in the United States of America versus uh, Lucy Diamond. And Mr. Sedalis, you're here for uh, Diamond. And are you ready to proceed with your argument? Yes, Your Honor. You may. Your Honors, and may it please the court. My name is Jason Segalos, and I, along with my co-counsel, Mr. Washington, represent Lucy Diamond, the appellant in this case. At this time, Chief Judge, we'd like to request two minutes for rebuttal. Okay. This case is about whether a legal permanent resident should be taken away from her mother and her child for improperly securing a car seat when she was never notified of and actively misinformed about her ability to seek discretionary relief. Accordingly, this court should reverse the district court's order and dismiss Lucy's indictment. In a few moments, my co-counsel will explain why the statute Lucy violated did not prescribe conduct involving moral turpitude. But first, I will show why the immigration judges failure to inform Lucy of her ability to seek a waiver of her deportation violated Lucy's due process rights and resulted in prejudice. Lucy's indictment for illegal reentry under 8 USC 
section 1326 cannot stand if the entry of the order was, quote, fundamentally unfair. Now, it's fundamentally unfair if Lucy can show that there was a due process violation that resulted in prejudice. Here, she successfully showed both. The U.S. Supreme Court in Mendoza v. Lopez explained and outlined the procedures for collaterally attacking one's indictment for illegal reentry by attacking the underlying removal order, which is a predicate for the offense of illegal reentry. In that case, that court explained, quote, where the defects in an administrative proceeding foreclose judicial review of that proceeding, an alternative means of obtaining judicial review must be made available before the order can be used in a subsequent criminal proceeding. In that case, that court outlined examples of things that fundamentally deprive uh, the non-citizen or in this instance, a legal permanent resident of due process. That court explained that things like a coerced confession or adjudication like a biased judge are examples of due process violations. But that court also explained, quote, analogous abuses could operate to deny effective judicial review of an administrative determination. And here, that's exactly what we've seen. An IJ who did not notify Lucy of her right to seek discretionary relief and actively misinformed Lucy about that possibility. As you can see on page three of the record, when Lucy asked whether there was any way she could stay in the United States with her mother and her child, the IJ said, quote, there is no other relief available to you. That- This, this is Judge Wilson, uh, Mr. Segalas. The uh, immigration judge did not prevent Ms. Diamond from applying for a waiver. It just simply failed to inform her that she could. How could that constitute uh, um, a denial of her due process rights? Yes, Your Honor. So two things. One, it's not just that she didn't inform her of the right to seek discretionary relief. And thus, and then your question would make more sense in terms of she could still seek it. Here, the IJ actively misinformed her of whether or not there was other relief available to her. That is an example of an IJ foreclosing judicial review of their determination by telling Lucy, telling a legal permanent resident that there was no way that she could stay in the country when that just was not true. Second, the Second Circuit in U.S. versus Copeland identified that an IJ has a heightened burden than an Article III judge in these proceedings. The IJ's job is not merely to be a neutral fact finder. The IJ's job is to uh, create a record and explain the rights and obligations that the United States has in relationship to the non-citizen in the immigration proceeding. And it's that heightened burden on the IJ when they're often dealing with pro se applicants who oftentimes English is not their first language and don't have a right to counsel. It's an IJ's heightened job to explain what exactly the applicant or non-citizen can do to stay in the country. And here what we see is an IJ not informing the applicant of discretionary relief, but then also actively misinforming Lucy about the possibility to get discretionary relief. How do you get around the Sixth Circuit's decision in Tomsek versus Whitaker? The Sixth Circuit held that there's no constitutionally protected liberty interest in obtaining discretionary relief from deportation. How do you distinguish your case from the Sixth Circuit? No, Your Honor, I can't distinguish this case from the Sixth Circuit case. The facts are quite similar. But what I can do is explain why the Sixth Circuit was wrong. Uh, the Sixth Circuit uh, identified that there was no constitutional right to discretionary relief. And that's correct. There's no right to get discretionary relief. However, what the U.S. Supreme Court in Mendoza versus Lopez identified is that there is a liberty interest in, in seeking judicial review of one's removal order. And there is a liberty interest in not being deported. Uh, here, Counselor, This is Judge Baker. Isn't the difference here, we're not talking about judicial review. This is entirely discretionary and up to the attorney general. So even if she had been informed under Section 212H of the ability to seek review, the attorney general was had no obligation to grant it. It was entirely discretionary, correct? Correct, Your Honor. However... So so how does the right attach to something? How does a liberty interest attach 
when it's entirely discretionary? How, how can you have a, a vested interest when it's entirely discretionary by the executive branch? Two ways, Your Honor. First, as the Second Circuit identified in U.S. versus Copeland, there is an easy way to distinguish between the right to the underlying relief and the right to seek that relief in the first instance. And here, what the Supreme Court in Mendoza-Lopez identified as a due process violation was the preclusion of a person's ability to seek relief in the first instance. And that's what they described as analogous abuses, that operation to foreclose judicial review. The second way is that the IJ's regulations, and this is 8 CFR section 1240.11A12, says that the IJ shall inform the alien of his or her apparent eligibility to apply for any of the benefits enumerated. And that's exactly what section 212H relief is. The Ninth Circuit has interpreted that regulation to explain why the IJ, therefore, has a burden to explain discretionary relief available to applicants. And this is especially true given the IJ's role in these proceedings as more than just a neutral fact finder, as somebody who does have an obligation to do what could be amount, could be considered a fair bit of handful. And Counselor, this is Judge Wood. And I think we all understand the circuit split that you're explaining. We've got the Second Circuit and the Ninth Circuit on one hand, and then basically most of the other circuits on the other. What policy reasons should lead us to side with the Second and Ninth Circuits when so many of our sister circuits have declined to do that? Two policy reasons, Your Honor. The first is, as the Second Circuit outlined in Copeland, and as I may be talking about too much, the IJ has a different burden than in what a normal Article III judge has in terms of playing a neutral fact finder. The persons that they're dealing with are do not have have a right to counsel. They are often pro se. English is often not their first language. The IJ's statutory uh, burden and the regulations governing what they do explain that they have a heightened burden to explain their eligibility for other forms of relief. And it's those uh, distinctions between an in administrative proceeding and an, uh, an Article III trial that, uh, that are a policy re reason for this. The second is just that the other circuits got it wrong. Mendoza versus Lopez considered what those other circuits ruled on, that there's no liberty interest or property interest in discretionary relief. And that's exactly what Chief Justice Rehnquist wrote in dissent in Mendoza, Mendoza Lopez. There, the Chief Justice said, it's up to the grace of the Attorney General to provide this. But the majority rejected that. This, the Supreme Court said that that was not a compelling enough reason to decide that there was no due process interest and the ability to have judicial review or some reconsideration of an underlying removal order. And Go sorry, I, I thought I saw a question coming. I'll, I'll let you finish that and then I'll ask my question. Uh, I was just about to say that that segues nicely into prejudice. So this seems like a good time. And, and that's what I was gonna ask you about precisely is uh, the hardships that uh, your client identifies seem to be really um, in the heartland, seem to be the, the hardships that any individual faces. And so how does she get over the ability to show prejudice under the circumstances of her case? Uh, two ways, Your Honor. So the Ninth Circuit does a really good job of distinguishing what those normal forms of hardship uh, that you identified in extreme hardship. So in the cases of Arietta and Arc Hernandez, the Ninth Circuit identified that normal hardships like economic problems and the difficulties of relocation are just that, normal hardships associated with being deported. However, in Arietta, the court said that there are things that rise above normal hardships to extreme hardships. And those included the existence of family ties in the United States. And they described that as, quote, the most important factor in determining hardship. Here, uh, Lucy is a mother to a toddler, and she moved to the United States and became a legal permanent resident for the purpose of caring for her elderly mother, which she continues to do to this day. And it's those additional emotional health and family ties that rise above the level of normal hardship, which could be considered just economic hardship, to a level of extreme hardship. Now, in order to show prejudice, the, there are a couple of ways to approach this. The Ninth Circuit has used a plausible likelihood of relief standard. And here, we see absolutely satisfy, satisfies a plausible likelihood of relief because there is compelling evidence that she and her family would suffer extreme hardship. 
I should note that extreme hardship is about extreme hardship to her relatives, not necessarily to Lucy herself. If, if you're related to uh, a legal permanent resident or a citizen, it's about the hardship to them. Here, the hardship is to her son, who's two to three years old, and her elderly mother that she came to the United States to, came, uh, to, to, to care for in the first place. And because of that evidence and because of those factors, there is a plausible likelihood that Lucy would have received discretionary relief from the attorney general. Now, a second way to approach this is what uh, the Second Circuit does and several other circuits do, and that's asking whether or not there is a reasonable probability or reasonable likelihood that they would receive relief. Now, the district court misinterpreted what the Second Circuit said. The district court uh, cited a Second Circuit case but ignored later Second Circuit cases defining what reasonable likelihood or reasonable probability meant. So in U.S. versus Perez, which is a Second Circuit case, uh, the Second Circuit said prejudice had resulted in that case because the non-citizen was eligible for 212C relief and, quote, could have made a strong showing in support of such relief. And that's- Mr. Gallas, Mr. Gallas, this is Judge Wilson. Is an extreme hardship just one factor uh, that the Attorney General can take into consideration in addition to several other factors as well? So why would this factor predominate over all the other factors? that gives the attorney general discretion. Uh, correct, Your Honor. So it is ultimately up to the attorney's general dis attorney general's discretion to decide whether or not the extreme hardship would outweigh other considerations, such as the dangerousness, the, the danger presented by allowing the non-citizen to remain in the country. So in most cases like that, we're talking about somebody who has family ties, but who's also convicted of violent crimes. That's not the case here. Lucy has uh, two misdemeanors on her record, one of which was failing to, improper, to properly secure a car seat. She's not the type of dangerous person that would uh, preclude her ability to show extreme hardship, that that would outweigh uh, these considerations. The second thing is that she doesn't have to show 100% chance that she would receive discretionary relief. That would be too burdensome, as the Eighth Circuit has said. What she has to show is a reasonable likelihood of success. Now, fortunately for me, even if you don't find these arguments compelling, if we win either that she was not convicted of a crime involving moral turpitude or that her due process uh, rights were deprived, then we can win either way under this circuit's holding in Odell. So with that, I'll turn it over to my colleague. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Thank Mr. You. Ellis, and I believe you have reserved some time for rebuttal. And we'll hear from Mr. Washington. Morning. I think you're on mute, Mr. Uh, Mr. Washington. You're going to need to un unmute that. There you go. Got it. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Perfect. Perfect. And I think I might have left my step stool, so I don't know if you can see me that well either. We can see you fine. Uh, see you. Perfect. Perfect. Good morning. May it please the court. My name is Andre Washington. And I also represent Ms. Diamond. Uh, another reason why Ms. Diamond is entitled to relief is because the Georgia statute does not prescribe a crime involving moral turpitude. The district court ruling should be uh, overturned for the following two reasons. First, because a plain language of the Georgia statute does not constitute a crime involving moral turpitude. And second, the district court misapplied the categorical approach when analyzing uh, Ms. Diamond's conviction. To my first point, I'd like to direct the panel to page 14 of the record. There, the statute states, uh, in the statute, uh, Georgia statute 19, section 1964, that an individual is guilty of child endangerment when they knowingly acts in a manner likely to cause serious injury. Now, crimes involving moral turpitude uh, it's, it's a generally ambiguous phrase, but it's been accepted to a generally, as generally meaning base, vile, or depraved actions that are gross deviation from the general standard of care. Um, so courts haven't come to a particular statutory language related to it, but that's the generally accepted uh, language. Part and parcel of that language is, uh, part and parcel of an analyzing crimes involving moral turpitude is an evil intent or a serious threat of injury or harm, an imminent threat of injury or harm. Now, courts across the country have used that standard, 
that serious threat of imminent harm or the, uh, again, the evil intent motive in order to analyze crimes involving moral turpitude. In matter of Flores, the BIA looked at uh, the test to determine whether or not a crime of, of moral turpitude as, again, a vicious motive of a corrupt mind. And looking at the statute uh, that the individual, the non-citizen was convicted of there was willfully, knowingly, and unlawfully conspiring to fraud, defraud the United States. Again, we can point to matter of Abu Simino. The Board of Am uh, Immigration Appeals noted that crimes in which evil intent is not an element, no matter how serious the act or how harmful the consequences, do not involve moral turpitude. Mr. There, Washington, um, this is Judge Wood. And just before we look at the, the precedent, just looking at this very case, uh, we know from U.S. versus Star in the 14th Circuit that theft of services is a crime involving moral turpitude. How could it be that endangering a child is more morally sound than jumping a subway terminal? So two things. First, the theft of services charge would fall up uh, within the petty exception offense uh, related to crimes involving moral turpitude. And it also deals with uh, her jumping a turnstile when she was a teenager. And the question here today relates specifically to the child endangerment statute. And that takes me a little bit to point two. And so I'm happy to address that for you, Judge Wood. The child endangerment statute here in Georgia plainly states knowingly acting in a manner that would endanger uh, a child. Courts have been reluctant to turn, turn crimes of nuisance in, uh, uh, into crimes involving moral turpitude. Again, pointing back to the way we analyze crimes involving moral turpitude, it isn't just knowingly. Knowingly isn't enough. It is actually putting an individual in danger of uh, imminent danger or, or threat of serious harm. Here, the underlying Georgia statute is overly broad, and that takes us to the categorical approach itself. It doesn't look at the underlying facts, but the language of the statute. And what it looks like is, does this statute categorically or unequivocally fall into a crime involving moral turpitude? Meaning, under every circumstance that an individual is charged, would this constitute a crime involving moral turpitude? Well, Counselor, Black's Law Dictionary defines knowingly as understanding that social harm will be a consequence, yet not caring whether that social harm occurs. So isn't knowing you're committing a crime enough to state you acted contrary to the accepted rules of morality? So your honor is correct that knowing is, knowing is an essential component of this statute, but knowing does not constitute a crime involving moral turpitude. Again, crimes involving moral turpitude at an, a larger level uh, involve, a, again, that base, vow, and depraved and gross deviation. We can point to, again, Hernandez Cruz versus Holder. There, the Third Circuit looked at the same type of statute, a child endangerment statute, that involved uh, some level of harm to uh, endangerment to a child, but the court was reluctant to individually look at uh, the endangerment or the knowingly endangerment uh, component as sufficient to constitute a crime involving moral turpitude. There, the evil intent and the imminent threat of harm or death was uh, an important component in, in order to equate it to a crime involving moral turpitude. We can look at Knapp versus Ashcroft. There, the Third Circuit affirmed, affirmed a conviction of a crime involving moral turpitude because the statute contained aggravating factors such as the, again, risk of death to a person and a depraved indifference for human life. Here, we don't have that depra depraved indifference to human life in the statutory language or in the underlying facts. Mr. Washington, this is, this is Judge Wilson. The, the, the courts sort of disagree on the proper way to apply this categorical approach, the three different ways to apply it. Which way should we um, adopt for the purpose of this case? So, uh, Your Honor, if I understand your question correct, is which categorical approach should we apply? And so this leads to a very important point, point of the argument is that the categorical approach has multiple methods in order to apply. We would are, we contend that the least culpable conduct standard is the best approach. The least culpable conduct standard looks at the plain language of the statute and says, is there the evil intent and the gross deviation from norms in order to that uh, to constitute a crime involving moral turpitude? The lower Counselor, court, this, this is, is a, Judge, Judge Wood again. Doesn't application of the least culpable 
sort of hypothetical conduct approach, how does that not run afoul of the U.S. Supreme Court's decision in Moncrief? So we would argue that, uh, so the, the, this statute specifically, again, looks at the actual language of the statute and doesn't look at the underlying facts. And so important to note that it is aligned with the categorical approach because the categorical approach is specifically focused on looking at all circumstances that uh, an individual could be potentially charged under uh, the, cate the categorical approach in order to be convicted of a crime involving moral turpitude. Here, this statute, again, is overbroad. In, in, in a particular uh, a hypothetical example, if I uh, incorrectly fastened a floaty uh, on one of my nephews and allowed them to jump in a pool, I could be convicted of child endangerment. That doesn't uh, necessarily constitute a gross deviation from a general standard of care in a depraved and vile way. Under any test, using, uh, under the categorical approach, this statute and the underlying facts uh, doesn't rise to the level of crime involving moral turpitude. Well, the BIA used the realistic probability test. Isn't that the more widely adopted test? And how does she meet her burden under that test, the realistic probability test? So the, the lower court misapplied the realistic probability test for two reasons. First, the realistic probability, in Duane Alvarez, the court established or promulgated the realistic probability test, and it said that an individual can look at uh, another case charged under the same statute or facts established in their own record. Here, we know that they completely ignored uh, on page nine, the facts established in the record. Now, let me say at the outset, we don't favor the least, uh, the realistic probability standard for the reason, uh, the same reason that uh, we choose the categorical approach. It looks at the underlying facts and we think the underlying facts cut in our favor. So here, the underlying facts are, you have a mom that's driving too fast for conditions who doesn't fail to strap in her child, but improperly fastens a car seat. Now, you know, in any circumstance, fastening a car seats can sometimes feel like operating a Rubik's cube. So under those circumstances, again, that doesn't seem like a gross deviation from a uh, standard care or depraved or vile activity. Point here being the court completely ignored those facts and offered, asked a pro se litigant in high stakes litigation to offer case law in our own defense. Now this violates elementary rules of fairness. Uh, in Jordan versus DeGeorge, the court noted that for purposes of uh, constitutional purposes, deportation proceedings are to be treated as criminal proceedings. And in that there's the rule of lenity. And the rule of lenity says ambiguities such as crimes involving more turpitude should be construed in favor of the non-citizen. And so here we have high stakes litigation where you have a pro se litigant pleads guilty to child endangerment, and then is faced with the consequences that she might be permanently removed from the place that she's chosen to call home. That offends, again, fundamental notions of fairness and the rule of lenity that construes the facts in the statute in order to uh, assess whether or not this is the appropriate punishment for the crime. This is why we- Mr. Washington, I want to ask you about something you said earlier, because it struck me and I, I keep going back to it. I heard you say that courts are reluctant to classify nuisance crimes as crimes involving moral turpitude, but is an offense in which somebody pleads guilty to knowingly endangering a child using the categorical approach, is it really appropriate to classify that or categorize that as a nuisance? So no, Your Honor. There is no circumstance where we should just unilaterally classify something as serious as child endangerment as a nuisance crime. The point there was the court, courts are reluctant to unilaterally take a broad approach when it comes to every statute and uh, as categorically being crimes involving moral turpitude where there isn't an evil intent. So it would in effect take charges like uh, in some cases assault which is serious and frowned upon, but not necessarily a crime involving moral turpitude. And so it would take a crime of nuisance, petty assault potentially, and, and, and classify it as a crime involving moral turpitude. Here, the most operative point is the knowing factor in this statute does not rise to the level uh, that uh, is commiserate with the evil intent sufficient to constitute a crime involving moral turpitude. 
Counsel, this is Judge Baker. You've said a few times during your argument that the statute is overbroad, and you argued before the lower court that the statute should be void for vagueness. Are you asking us to go down that road today, or are you simply stating that it doesn't fit within the categorical approach? I'm first, Your Honor is correct that I'm stating that this does not fit within the categorical approach as being categorically or unequivocally a crime involving moral turpitude. Second, on the question of vagueness, vagueness uh, understanding the posture of this court under Jordan versus DeGeorge, the Supreme Court has noted that uh, more crimes about moral turpitude is not necessarily a vague term, at least in the purposes of fraud there. So we're bound by that precedent. Now we do recognize that under Johnson that there might be a question of vagueness, but that isn't the question before us today. We would say under any test, uh, this isn't categorically or unequivocally a crime involving moral turpitude. And, you know, we could and we should go through the kind of intellectual exercise and the scholastic, legal scholastic exercise of understanding where the line is. And that can be ambiguous. And so again, under the rule of lenity, we can, should construe that in favor of the defendant. Here's why. The ultimate question before this court today is whether or not we are going to permanently separate Ms. Diamond from the country she's chosen to call home and from her child, who's a US citizen and her aging mother for failing to properly put her child in a car seat. And Counsel, let me, uh, this is Judge Wood. Let me go back to a question Judge Baker asked you bringing up the void for vagueness uh, issue. Are you giving up any hope of distinguishing the DeGeorge, Jordan versus DeGeorge majority? As I understand it, they may have cabined uh, their view of crime involving moral turpitude uh, to crimes involving fraud. Did they leave you any door open by noting that it may mean something else in peripheral cases? Is there any way we can take up Justice Jackson's um, dissent and, and utilize it in your favor today? Your Honor, I see I'm out of time. May I, may I answer? Judge Wilson? May. Yes, Judge Wilson. You may. Thank you. So Your Honor is correct. The dissent in uh, uh, the George versus Jordan, Jordan excuse me, um, does leave the, that door open. Uh, and you know, to the extent that it is helpful for Ms. Diamond, yes, we would contend that it might offer an, a door open, uh, opening. But ultimately, the question here, the, the, the main point here is, this statute does not categorically or unequivocally constitute a crime involving moral turpitude. And secondarily, the underlying facts do not constitute uh, uh, or give rise to uh, de deportation and permanent removal from her child. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Washington. And we will now hear from the government. Uh, Mr. Meyer, are you prepared to present your argument? Yes, sir. Uh, I'm looking for the clock, but I am pre prepared to argue. <laughs> All right, the clock is up and ready to begin running. Oh, it's okay. I see it's further down the page. Chief Justice, Associate Justices, may it please the court. My name is Dylan Meyer, and I, along with my co-counsel, Ms. Hermanson, represent the appellee in this case, the United States government. There are two issues on appeal today. The first, whether the appellant was afforded a fundamentally fair removal proceeding before the immigration judge. And second, whether the appellant's conviction for endangering the welfare of her son constitutes a crime of moral turpitude. I will be addressing the first issue on appeal, the appellant, that the appellant's removal proceeding was fundamentally fair. This argument is broken into two parts. First, the appellant cannot demonstrate that her removal proceeding was fundamentally unfair because she does not have a constitutional right to be informed of discretionary relief. And second, the appellant cannot show that either her or her family suffered extreme prejudice as a result of her removal. Therefore, the government respectfully requests this court to affirm the decision of the 14th Circuit Court of Appeals and find that the appellant was afforded due process in her removal hearing before the immigration judge. To my first point, appellant challenges the fundamental fairness of her order of removal issued after she pled guilty 
to endangering the welfare of her son, where a non-citizen collaterally challenges an indictment for illegal reentry on the basis of a prior removal order, she bears the burden of establishing each element required by federal law. The circuits agree for appellant to establish fundamental unfairness, she must show that her due process rights were violated by defects in the underlying deportation proceeding. And she must show that concrete prejudice resulted from the defects. This court in Kwong Hai Chu versus Colding held that the Fifth Amendment guarantee of due process means that although the government may later expel and deport the appellant, before her expulsion, she is entitled to notice of the nature of the charge and a hearing before an immigration or executive tribunal. If these two attributes are present, this court held, the permanent resident has not been deprived of her life, her liberty, or her property without due process of law. As noted by pages two and three of the record, Appellant was provided with a notice to appear as she re-entered the United States. Mr. Meyer, this notice is, yes, Your Honor. How can the government take the position that the appellant received a fundamentally fair hearing when the immigration judge affirmatively misled her? I, I know that, that you talk a lot about the, the immigration judge not having an obligation perhaps to advise of rights, but isn't it different when the the IJ affirmatively mislead the, uh, the immigrant? So, Your Honor, the government would contend that the immigration, the immigration judge's statement was not a lie. However, we certainly agree that the immigration judge could have been more clear in stating that they were communicating their belief that the appellant was not eligible to any form of relief. And that Counsel, their belief did not prevent... Counsel, this is Judge Baker, and I'm sorry to interrupt, but are you grappling with the language? I just don't see how you say this is not a lie. There is no other relief available to you. That's the direct language from the ILJ, and it didn't just not inform, it, uh, inform of 212H. It, it affirmatively misled. You want to call it a lie, affirmatively misleading? Isn't that lying? So, so Your Honor, there are two important parts to take with that. The first is, is that as your honors noted earlier, there was no affirmative denial of the ability to appeal. And the second, your honor, is that it's important to note that the record reference that the record that was before the immigration judge is not the record we have today. That record only contained the evidence of the appellant's two convictions, unless she had invoked her right to a merit hearing, which she did not. So looking at the statute and looking at 8 U.S.C. 1182H, 1182H has two sections, A and B, that allow for an immigrant to appeal for discretionary relief. Because the IJ had no facts in front of him or her that would establish that the appellant had family in the country, because the appellant, as we can see on pages two and three of the record, never invoked the right that her notice to appeal informed her of to uh, ask for a merits hearing, he's instead looking at section A which says that in the case of an immigrant, it is established to the satisfaction of the attorney general that the alien is admissible only under the subparagraph D and that the, uh, the alleged crime was 15 years before. So when we look at what the immigration judge said in that looking at the time frame, he's referencing the 15 years in subsection A. He's not looking at subsection B because he doesn't have the facts to know that she has a son in the country to know that she that her mother is a legal permanent resident here. And so Counselor, this, uh, this is uh, Judge Wood. Let's say hypothetically that um, through whatever avenue, Miss Diamond did actually make a timely and, and proper request for relief under Section 212 and uh, was told when she made that timely proper request, um, no, we're just not going to hear it. That would be improper, right? Yes, Your Honor, because she was so there isn't, after. So isn't there a distinction uh, in the one hand on the right to relief, which is unquestionably discretionary in this case, and what Diamond is actually complaining of here, which is the right to be considered for relief, which it seems like she was pretty unquestionably denied. So, Your Honor, uh, there are two parts that I'd like to, to look at. First, looking to the notice to appear, it informs her that she has the right to request a merit hearing. 
So the way that it would work is that she is detained at the international airport as she arrives in the United States. She is thereafter handed a notice to appear that says, you are subject to removal, or so we allege. And here are our facts for alleging that you are subject to removal. She appears on September 8th before the immigration judge, so almost two months later. At that hearing, all that happens is that the immigration judge says, I see that you have been convicted of two crimes. I adjudge them to be crimes of moral turpitude. And that's it. Do you agree or do you disagree? Looking at pages two and three of the record, the appellant agreed. She did not ask for a merit hearing. She did not, as her notice to appear tells her, she did not ask, may I present witnesses? May I present All evidence? All right, Counselor, let may me I let me just ask you this. What I'm asking you is, let's say hypothetically, I want you to just imagine that this is the case to test the bounds of your argument. Let's say she did request a Section 212 hearing and was denied. Let me first ask you, that would be improper, wouldn't it? Yes, Your Honor. That, I, I, as I noted previously, I agree with you. That, that would be improper. All right. Doesn't that mean that she has a property interest in having that hearing if she properly requests it? Your Honor, I, I would not say that she has a property interest because looking to this court's decision in Board of Regents versus Roth, this court held that a property interest is a safeguard of the security of interest that a person has already acquired in specific benefit. So she wouldn't have a property interest nor would she have, as this court recognized, she does not have a liberty interest. So she has the notice to appear says that Congress has given her the right to ask for a merits hearing, but she has to invoke that and she didn't. So that's not the case in this, in this instance on these facts in front of us today. So following this court's decision in Board of Regents versus Roth, where they enumerated eight liberty interests that are different, yes, your honor. This is Judge Davis. I want to ask you about um, the liberty interest involved here. Why, why is it uh, not a denial of a liberty interest to be prevented from seeking the, uh, the opportunity to influence the discretionary judgment of the Attorney General? Yes, Your Honor. So, so in Board of Regents versus Roth and in Washington versus Glucksburg, this court listed eight liberty interests that are protected by the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment, which mirror those in the Fifth Amendment. An appellant's interest, invented right to discretionary relief is notably different than each of those eight because it requests the government or requires the government to act on her behalf, whereas the eight this, court's re this court has recognized uh, are barriers from the government interfering in her life. So it is completely different in kind than those types of uh, rights that this court has recognized. And following this court's decision in Roth, the clear majority of circuits have held that the cancellation of removal under 1229B is a discretionary form of relief and does not confer upon appellant a liberty or a property interest. As we have noted, appellant has was provided with her notice to appear well, let me and thereafter stop. had a hearing Counsel, before you. I, I understand that it is considered by the courts a discretionary form of re relief. My question is why is it not a violation of her due process rights because the opportunity to seek the discretion is being denied by the process that's in play here? Your, Your Honor, as I noted, it's, it's because there there is no right to an opportunity to appeal. The, this court has recognized, it, it enumerated eight, eight liberty interests. Her liberty interest requires the government to act on her behalf. The interests that this court has recognized prevent the government from interfering in her life. So the reason why she doesn't have a liberty interest, she's not alleging a liberty interest. She's alleging that the government owed her a duty. That does not create a liberty interest. Um, so, so your honor, we would, we would contend that because she has failed to show that she, or because she received due process as defined by this court in Kwong Hai Chu versus Colding, and she has failed to articulate a due process right recognized by this court in Roth, um, she has failed to meet the burden to establish that she had a due process right. But even if your honor disagrees with me, um, she has still failed to satisfy the second prong of fundamental unfairness 
because she has not shown that the entry of the removal order was not prejudicial because it is not it was not probable that she would have received relief from removal let me, In ask, the United you, States, let me ask you this mr meyer even if it's not constitutionally mandated um to advise her of her right to seek discretionary relief how do you get around the regulation itself the statute 8 cfr 1240.11 uh, mandates that the immigration judge advise the non-citizen of her right to request discretionary relief. How do you get around the statute itself, even setting aside the constitutional issue? Yes, Your Honor. So, so two parts. The first is that that statute regulates internal affairs at the uh, uh, for the immigration judges. It does not create a right for the appellant in this case. And the second part is, is if we look to some of the cases that appellant is citing, her argument that she is statute, that her due pro, that uh, although her due process rights were not violated, the uh, hearing was statutorily deficient. Uh, if we look to United States versus Ubalda Figueredo coming out of the Ninth Circuit, we see that this is just redressing the due process question in a statutorily um, inept uh Dressing. It, the Ninth Circuit specifically said that because the judge is mandated to inform her of this relief, it is a violation of her due process. So we're, we would just be turning back to the first issue, which under Kwong Hai Chu versus Colden and under Board of Regents versus Roth and Washington versus Glucksburg, appellant has failed to meet the burden to demonstrate that she has a due process right. And Mr. Meyer, <laughs> this is uh, Judge Wood. By focusing on the uncertainty of relief under section 212 aren't you improperly conflating the due process analysis with the prejudice prong no no your honor because um although the statute grants the relief to the attorney general the attorney general has thereafter moved that that discretion down to the immigration judges so the same individual who would be required to inform her of this right would be the same individual who, based upon the record, as we noted earlier, is completely devoid of any facts, would thereafter be denying her relief. Um, and the majority of circuits, excluding only the second and the ninth, have held that the two are one and the same, that the right to uh, request relief and the right to relief are the same. Um, so appellant needed to show in her merits or in her hearing before the judge and not merely claim that her deportation would cause extreme hardship to a spouse, a parent, a child who is a U.S. citizen or lawful permanent resident. And counsel, can I ask you about that? You're getting to the prejudice prong. And uh, at page eight of the record, the district judge didn't really grapple with any of this, right? The district judge just said the boyfriend's not a spouse. It doesn't qualify. Would you agree that at the very least, if we're going to get to prejudice, we got to send it back down for the district judge to take a look at this anew? No, no, Your Honor, and it's looking to the Ninth Circuit in Shoestree versus INS, it held that to show she must present evidence. The record is completely devoid of any evidence, as the court in Shoestree noted that Shoestree offered no evidence regarding his wife's income and no evidence regarding why his family could not join him in Great Britain. Similarly here, she has provided no evidence to either contention. I see my time has expired. May I briefly conclude? Okay. Uh, for the foregoing reasons, this court should affirm the 14th Circuit Court of Appeals determination and find the petitioner was afforded a fundamentally fair hearing. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. Thank you, Mr. Meyer. And we'll now hear from uh, Ms. Hermanson. Okay. You may proceed, Ms. Hermanson. Chief Justice, and may I please the court. My name is Brittany Hermanson, and I am representing the appellee along with my co-counsel at the case of Bar. I will be arguing the second issue, broken up into two parts. First, whether a state conviction for child endangerment constitutes a crime involving moral turpitude. Second, whether the phrase moral turpitude is unconstitutionally vague. I ask this court to uphold the appellant's removal because her conduct falls within the category of crimes involving moral turpitude. 
and to, die, to deny the appellant's vagueness challenge to the phrase moral turpitude. As to the first issue, it is the position of the appellee that by applying the categorical analysis to the case at bar, demonstrates reason to deny appellant's challenge to her removal. Rather to apply the categorical analysis to the case at bar, as you can see on page eight of the record, is not in dispute. The Board of Immigration Appeals, also known as the BIA, the highest uh, interpreting body for immigration law, has expressly acknowledged that it is bound to this court's analysis to immigration law. This court has clarified how the categorical analysis functions in Taylor v. U.S. This approach looks only at the statutory definition of the offense, rather than the underlying facts of the conviction. To do this, the court specifically looked at the elements of the offense. I would like to point your attention to page 14 of the record under relevant statutes. The second conviction, um, as noted on page 8, the only issue on um, appeal regarding, uh, regarding moral turpitude is endangering the welfare of a child. Be convicted of this statute, it requires that he or she knowingly act in a manner likely to cause serious harm, injury to the physical, mental, moral welfare of a child by violating a duty of care to support and protect. A crime involving moral turpitude, according to the BIA, is a crime that is, character, character, uh, is characterized as conduct that is inherently base, vile, and deprived, and contrary to the accepted rules of morality and duties owed to other persons. This is consistent with co what Congress put forward in 1970 Immigration and Nationality Act. This required when non-citizens are taking an oath- now, Counsel, this is Judge Davis. Let, let me ask you about the categorical approach and its, and its reliance on knowledge. If a, if a person is capable of committing a negligent act, for example, that uh, is knowingly um, done, but negligently done, in this instance, failing to secure a child in a car seat, how does that rise to the level of, of turpitude that's contemplated by the moral turpitude standard? Yes, Your Honor. So as for both Taylor v. U.S. and Mathis v. U.S., this court looked at the elements of the offense rather than the facts underlying the conviction. The courts have compared this to the sentencing requirement, which they held in Mathis v. U.S. when they considered whether um, conduct fit within the burglary statute or offenses fit within that statute. So you think negligent conduct under the categorical approach is sufficient to satisfy the uh, moral turpitude necessary to find, in this case, a, a violation? Your Honor, that would be contingent upon whether that within the generic federal definition, which the variety of circuit courts, including the ninth, the third, and the second, have held to be child abuse. This court adopted the realistic probability test. This test looks at two things. First, it looks at whether the state conviction is more narrow than the federal generic definition, which the appellate courts have held child endangerment is narrow enough to satisfy the general federal definition of child abuse. Their reasoning for that was that they believed that endangering of a child can reasonably be viewed as abuse and neglect. The BIA supported this definition. The BIA held that an act or admission that constitutes maltreatment of a child um, is so broad that it is sufficiently encompasses this, this is Judge Wilson. In those cases involving reprehensible conduct, didn't they involve abuse instead of endangerment? Um, Your Honor, could you repeat that question? Didn't those cases um, involve abuse instead of uh, the cases that you rely on? Don't they involve abuse instead of endangerment? Your Honor, there are a split between the circuits. The cases I specifically mentioned, uh, Flores v. Holder, Gonzalez v. Alvarez, and Martinez v. Sabiello v. Sessions, the Ninth Circuit Court, those specifically held that child endangerment is uh, falls within the definition of child abuse. However, the circuit courts, including the New Mexico Court of Appeals and the Texas Court of Appeals, have looked at specifically child abuse or child 
the statutes when they applied the intent, um, which the appellate had argued that the evil intent is what would be required in order to decide whether this conduct fell within crimes involving moral turpitude. But that's inconsistent. Uh, that's inconsistent with what the BIA has suggested. The BIA suggested that when applying that standard, you can look at an intent element, but you can also look at deliberateness or recklessness. The New Mexico Court of Appeals and the Texas Court of Appeals held that child endangerment includes a conscious objective to endanger the child. They did not use the terminology of evil intent. Instead, they used a more broad standard, and that's exactly what the BIA has suggested. Congress never defined moral turpitude because they left that up to the courts to establish on a case-to-case -case basis. Applying the standard of intent here by looking specifically at the statute on board, uh, page 14 of the record, it shows that he or she knowingly acted in a manner likely to cause serious harm. This, yeah, is, so this is Judge Baker. Um, your proposed test, realistic probability test, don't we have to think about the context in which it would be used? If we rule that that's the test today, then that's applied not just in an adversarial proceeding like this where we have very talented lawyers appearing before us, but in the immigration proceeding itself where you have someone who's going to be pro se uh, and with the disadvantages that your opposing counsel suggested in their presentation. And to quote the district judge, they would be required to um, point to a case essentially uh, where uh, the um, statute would be applied that did not involve moral turpitude. Uh, isn't that a pretty high bar for a pro se unsophisticated litigant to hurdle? Your Honor, I would like to answer that in two parts. As far as the facts underlying the conviction, her mental state, or how this could affect her personal life, again, U.S. v. Taylor and Mathis said when applying the categorical analysis, which is uh, found on page 10 of the record, which specifically states that we need to look at the actual elements, the courts found that by applying the realistic probability test, we only look at whether the state conviction fits within the generic definition. So in regards to the second part, in Mathis v. U.S., they allowed Congress, um, they held that Congress has the power um, to overturn this approach because Congress has the power in determining immigration law and the courts have the power in interpreting that immigration law that Congress specifically established. Courts have Counsel, um, let me back you up a little bit and ask you how, how is the phrase crime involving moral turpitude any less vague than the phrase crime of violence? Yes, Your Honor. That actually brings me to my second issue and I'm happy to reach that first. Um, Sessions, which is also cited record is specifically a case um, that suggested that a crime a crime of violence was too vague. The difference here is that a crime of violence, uh, we're not dealing with violence in this case. We're dealing with moral turpitude. As suggested by Congress when they initiated the 1970 Immigration Act, they were concerned that that good moral character standard would be met. And that's why the BIA has suggested the definition that is suggested and appellate courts in this court have adopted it. And for precisely the reason you've outlined, it seems like crime of violence is a lot more concrete and easier to understand and easier to agree upon than a more ephemeral phrase like moral turpitude. After all, violence is blood and guts and knives and, and slapping and things like that. Moral turpitude is in your own words, the accepted rules of morality. Where would somebody like Miss Diamond turn to to find these rules? Your Honor, Congress was specifically vague when they established moral turpitude, and they did this deliberately. Um, it's, it's Congress's job to write the law, but it's also the court's job to interpret what Congress has written. Congress did not give a definition to this because for two reasons. As cited in Jordan v. McGeorge, they look at the history, but they also look at its context outside of immigration law. I'd like to give the example of New Mexico, uh, the New Mexico Supreme Court and the Georgia Supreme Court. These courts looked at um, a case when a bar application after law school. Because they didn't disclose that they had DUIs on their record, the courts held that that was a moral turpitude and that was enough for them not to be eligible for the bar. Courts have applied this vagueness term in a variety of different areas. 
So by accepting the appellant's argument and narrowing it down specifically to immigration would defeat Congress's purpose in this term being flexible. This term is over 125 years old. It's been applied in multiple different areas of law, especially in contract law when there's terms that require um, moral turpitude where an, an, an employer, they include the word moral turpitude and it is violated by the employee, they have the right um, to avoid the breach of contract claim. It's also been used in evidentiary hearings um, where impeachment becomes an issue. It has been used in a variety of different areas of law. And Congress specifically designed- uh, it, it, um, If I may, this is Judge Howard. You said earlier that, that Congress intentionally made it vague, but wouldn't you agree that even if Congress intentionally made it vague, it is the duty of the court, if it is impermissibly vague, to send it back to Congress and require them to give a better definition? Your Honor, there has been a variety of different petitions and nonprofit organizations and appellate courts that have appealed to Congress asking them to specifically identify a concrete definition to the term moral turpitude, they have denied to do so. In light of immigration law, the BIA is the highest administrating body for interpreting immigration law, but Congress also has the power in interpreting immigration law and making determinations within that. And if, if according to the BIA, knowledge alone is sufficient to satisfy the requirement of evil intent to make something a crime involving moral turpitude, isn't it just way, way too overbroad? Any crime that is, any offense that's committed knowingly? Well, Your Honor, we we look at the elements of the statute because appellant has already pled guilty to two crimes involving moral turpitude. We look at the actual conviction, and that's what Mathis and Taylor did, is they looked at the conviction and said the facts aren't relevant here, and they compared this to a post-conviction post sentencing requirement, which is similar to what we do today. A post-conviction requirement ha ha happens after a plea or after someone has been convicted of, a, of a, an offense. The same issue is here today. We're not considering whether she's been convicted of a crime. She pled guilty, which means that she had to convince the judge um, that, she, that she understood the offense and that she knowingly committed the crime. But she also had to act in a way which, in a manner that was likely to cause serious injury and moral welfare to the child. So by looking at the statute and the word knowingly, we apply that to an intent, which courts, like I said earlier, the two courts, um, the New Mexico Court of Appeals and the Texas Court of Appeals have specifically applied this conscious objective. This is a broad standard. It's broad because Congress made it that way. Congress has had multiple opportunities to define it. And this court has as well. In Jordan v. McGeorge, this court specifically held that uh, moral turpitude is not void for vagueness. Council, when uh, Congress first crafted this 125 years ago, and when the U.S. Supreme Court examined it 69 years ago, there may have been well understood rules of morality. But wouldn't you agree that our society in general has become less homogenous in what may have been perfectly understood entirely clearly as one voice long ago may not be the case today? Well, Your Honor, that would fall on the fact that the courts would have responded, to that, this court would respond to that today using the same analysis that they used in Jordan by saying that it's used outside of the immigration context. Congress ex especially did not define it because they wanted this term that has been used since prior to 1970, the first time it was used in immigration context, but they wanted it to continue to be used so that it could be flexible and that it could change with time. So yes, it may be um, it may be broad, or there may not be a concrete definition. But as long as the courts have interpreted it consistent with Congress's goal in requiring good moral character, the appellants are not only asking you to overturn Taylor. Um, Your Honor, I do see that I ran out of time. May I please take a moment to conclude? All right. And for these reasons, we ask this court to uphold the appellant's removal because her conduct falls within the category of moral turpitude and deny the appellant's vagueness challenge. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ms. Hermanson. And Mr. Segalas, I believe you have reserved two minutes for rebuttal. Thank you, Your Honor, and may it please the court. Knowingly or having knowledge is not the same thing as moral turpitude. And this is exactly demonstrated by the fact that this is a child endangerment rather than a child abuse statute, as Chief Judge Wilson identified. 
a parent can knowingly allow their child to climb a tree or ride a bike without a helmet. Yet that act of knowing does not mean that their reasonable parenting decision is morally turpidinous. It doesn't mean that it rises to the level of vile or depraved behavior that historically has been associated with this term over the past 100 years. So the mere presence of that intent requirement does not elevate this to a moral uh, a, a statute that prescribes moral turpitude. Second, the government has argued the IJ did not know the facts that would have given rise to 212 relief. However, that's the IJ's job. The statute for this, 8 U.S.C. section 1229 AB1 says, quote, the IJ shall administer oaths, receive evidence, interrogate, examine, and cross-examine the alien and any witnesses. This is supported by the Second Circuit's precedent that an IJ is more than just a neutral fact finder. They are the one to create the record. So if it's correct that the IJ did not create the record and failed to elicit the facts from Ms. Diamond about her family and the extreme hardship against them, that's the IJ's fault. And that demonstrates why there is a violation of Lucy's due process rights. This is demonstrated as the Second Circuit articulated that IJs have a duty to develop admin the administrative record because our removal system relies on IJs to explain the law accurately to pro se aliens. As was shown here, the IJ actively misinformed Lucy, but that's a problem because aliens, quote, would have no way of knowing what information was relevant. So if the facts were not in the record about extreme hardship, that's the IJ's fault, not Lucy's, and therefore this court must reverse the district court and dismiss her indictment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sagalas. And I believe that completes our arguments this morning. And I see that uh, the court will now begin to deliberate. And so we will be back in the courtroom at 11.25 a.m. So this court will be in recess until 11.25.
Looks like everyone is back in the courtroom and everyone is unmuted. <clears throat> and so first of all, I would like to congratulate the sponsors, the law firm Smith Halsey and Busey and Smith Gamble and Russell on conducting another successful moot court competition between these two excellent law schools. I know how much time and effort and planning is expended and so I'd like to commend Steve Busey and Dana Bradford and Lanny Russell for their efforts in putting this competition together. You all did great work, again, for having another successful competition, especially this year with the constraint of a pandemic and the transition to virtual arguments. But the uh, arguments went without a hitch. I'd also like to commend Professor uh, Monk from the University of Georgia Law School and Professor Little from the University of Florida Law School who helped prepare the competitors for this competition. Uh, you should both be very proud of the, the accomplishments of your students this morning. Um, they did a great job. And also the great work of our deans, uh, Dean uh, Rutledge and Dean Rosenberry. We are doing an outstanding job of maintaining a program of legal education to prepare these students for the practice of law. So thank you very much. Well, the students uh, were very talented competitors and they gave excellent arguments. Um, as I indicated earlier, moot court is uh, it's an important contribution to a law, law student's legal education because it affords you not just the opportunity to develop a professional skill, but, uh, but also to build, to build confidence. And that was, the one, of the, that was the, one of the most important things during our deliberations a few minutes ago that stood out, how confident these students were and how well prepared they were. You were all very well prepared. You were familiar with the uh, cases that apply to these issues. You were familiar with the press with the precedent that applied to these issues. They're all very responsive to our questions. And uh, one of the things I was most impressive about, and I, if I recall, when we asked you about opposing authority, you were able to address opposing authority head on and explain why your case was different than the uh, cases that, that did not support your position on the issues. Um, Y'all just did an outstanding job. And, you know, um, we um, deliberated, and I'll tell you why. The, the competition was close. It was very close um, to determine who has the bragging rights to keep that championship trophy at their law school for the next year. Um, but I am uh, pleased to announce that the winner of this year's competition is the team from the University of Georgia. Congratulations. Congratulations to Georgia and congratulations as well to the University of Florida. You both did an outstanding job and made our made our deliberation very, very difficult. So congratulations. And some of the other judges might want to add some comments if they'd like uh, before the competition is adjourned. You like? Say thank you. Uh, we we just like to say thank you to the the uh, Smith and Halsey, uh, to, our, uh, to the sponsoring firms, to the panel of judges. We appreciate you, and uh, certainly also to our colleagues and competitors at the University of Florida. We enjoyed this competition, and we're so grateful to have participated in this groundbreaking virtual experience. So thank you. Thank you. Well, all four of you have a great future ahead of you. I'll tell you what, you're so. Uh, impressive with your background, not just your argument, but uh, you know we got some biographical information at the very beginning. So we're very impressed with the uh, not just the quality of your advocacy, but the work you're doing right now in preparing yourself to practice law. All four of you did an outstanding job. So the best of luck to all four of you in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Well, is there anything further that we need to uh, consider this morning? 
If not, until next year, the United <laughs> States Court of Appeals for the 14th Circuit is hereby adjourned. Good luck to everybody. Here. Good luck. Good luck. Congratulations. Good luck. Best of luck. Thank you. To all of you. Go dogs. Go dogs. <laughs> Go dogs. Congratulations to everyone. <laughs> Hopefully the moot court curse will